It's Nikki Strong playing you the pop music you love on VOA One The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today, you will hear reports from Dan Novak and Jill Robbins. Later, Brian Lynn has this week's technology report. He reports on a proposed new system to equip airplanes with self-taxiing technology. Finally, we hear today's lesson of the day. But first... New research suggests that the sun's magnetic field forms much closer to the surface than scientists had thought. The finding could help predict periods of extreme solar storms like the ones that hit Earth earlier this month. The magnetic field appears to form 32,000 kilometers under the sun's surface. Earlier estimates suggested the formation began more than 209,000 kilometers below the sun's surface, an international team reported last week. The sun's strong magnetic energy is the source of solar flares and bursts of plasma known as coronal mass ejections. Plasma is a gas that creates an electromagnetic field. When directed toward Earth, the bursts create colorful displays in the sky. Such displays are also known as auroras. Auroras can also affect power and communications. Jeffrey Vazel is a professor at the University of Edinburgh's School of Mathematics. He is a lead writer of the new study, which appeared in the publication Nature. Fazel said, we still don't understand the sun well enough to make accurate predictions of space weather. The Italian scientist Galileo was among the first astronomers to study sunspots. He did so in the early 1600s. Solar flares and coronal mass ejections often occur near sunspots. The dark spots as big as Earth are located near the most intense parts of the sun's changing magnetic field. Fazel and his team created new models of the interaction between the sun's magnetic field and the flow of plasma. The interaction varies at different latitudes during an 11-year cycle. The team then entered their calculations into a NASA supercomputer in California. The results suggested a shallow magnetic field. More research is needed to confirm the finding, however. The new knowledge should improve long-term solar forecasts, permitting scientists to better predict the strength of the sun's future cycles. The sun is nearing its peak level of activity in the current 11-year cycle. This is a reason for the recent solar storms. Strong solar flares and outbursts of billions of tons of plasma earlier this month created severe solar storms that produced auroras in unexpected places. Earlier this month, the sun released its biggest solar flare in almost 20 years, but it avoided Earth. Daniel Lequane is a professor at Northwestern University in Illinois. He is one of the study's co-writers. He said better understanding of the sun can help make sure that we are prepared for when the next storm, potentially much more dangerous, hits Earth. I'm Dan Novak. The local officials protecting Mount Fuji are making changes to protect its natural beauty and the safety of people climbing it. 
Those who want to hike one of the most popular paths or trails on Japan's famous Mount Fuji will have to buy a ticket starting on July 1st. Officials aim to reduce crowds, littering, and climbers who rush too quickly to the top. The Mount Fuji climbing season lasts from July 1st to September 10th. The system for buying tickets is for those walking on the Yoshida Trail. It is on the side of the 3,776 meter high mountain that is within Yamanashi Prefecture. Climbers can also climb the mountain in Shizuoka Prefecture, southwest of Mount Fuji. Shizuoka has requested a voluntary fee of about $6 per climber since 2014 and is looking for ways to balance tourism and environmental protection. Mount Fuji is a stratovolcano, a tall, steep-sided mountain formed by layers of volcanic materials, such as ash and lava. UNESCO chose it as a World Cultural Heritage Site in 2013. The new rules will permit only 4,000 climbers to enter the trail per day for a hiking fee of about $18. Yamanashi Prefecture officials said 3,000 of those tickets will be available on the Internet, and the other 1,000 can be bought in person on the day of the climb. Hikers may also give an additional amount for protecting the mountain's natural resources. Climbers can request tickets on the Mount Fuji climbing website. The Environment Ministry and the mountain's two home prefectures Yamanashi and Shizuoka, operate the site. Mount Fuji has three main trails. There are ten stations. Each is at a different height or altitude. Most hikers begin at the fifth station, where there is a bus stop. Under the new system, climbers must choose between a day hike or an overnight stay at a shelter along the trail. Hikers who reach the fifth station after 4 p.m. and are not staying overnight have to go back down. This rule is to stop bullet climbing or rushing to the top without enough rest. Traveling to a high point too quickly can cause altitude sickness, which includes headaches, dizziness, and nausea. A symbol of Japan, the mountain, called Fujisan, was once thought of as a holy volcano. Today, many hikers climb to the top to see the sunrise. To see the sunrise, hikers often stay at a shelter at the 7th or 8th station and climb to the top in the early morning darkness. Hiking in the dark increases the chance of injury. But a major problem is the large amount of waste people have left behind plastic bottles, food, and even clothing. The Environment Ministry reports that during the climbing season in 2023, over 220,000 people went up Mount Fuji. That is close to the pre-pandemic level, and officials expect more visitors this year. Last year, more than 25 million visitors came to Japan. The Japan National Tourism Organization expects that number to rise in 2024 to over 32 million. I'm Jill Robbins. European aerospace company Airbus has fitted a special truck with airplane controls in an effort to test self-taxiing abilities. Airbus officials recently introduced the truck in Paris at Europe's largest technology event, VivaTech. The electric vehicle can drive like a truck or it can activate the aircraft system controls. 
A demonstration showed how the truck works. It uses numerous cameras and sensors to help follow airport direction signals and avoid obstacles as computers guide the vehicle along its path. In a statement, Airbus described the effort as a three-year research project called Optimate. The goal is to deploy and test the best technologies to help aircraft better recognize their surroundings and current operating conditions. In addition, the company said detailed data from the experiments will be examined to help develop pilot assistance systems for airport taxiing. The technology demonstration came after several incidents of airplanes crashing on the ground at airports. One of those happened in January when a Japanese Airlines Airbus 350 was landing and hit a Coast Guard plane already on the runway. An investigation was launched last month after a British Airways jet struck a stationary Virgin Atlantic plane at London's Heathrow Airport. That crash caused only minor damage to both aircraft. And in February, U.S. investigators said they were looking into a crash involving two JetBlue planes at Logan International Airport in Boston. Airbus officials have said they hope the specially designed truck can show how self-taxiing or automation technology can help safely guide costly jets through increasingly crowded airports. The vehicle uses multiple technologies related to automation, navigation, and artificial intelligence. Mathieu Gallas is the head of automation research at Upnext, a special technology research laboratory for Airbus. He told Reuters news agency, these use cases are much more critical and complicated compared to those of the car industry. Slow-speed airport crash incidents rarely result in serious injuries or deaths, but they represent a costly and growing problem for airlines, airports, insurers, and passengers. Such incidents can cause major passenger delays. They also can lead to costly plane repairs. The chief executive of Upnext is Michael Ogello. He said in a statement that a big aim of the Optimate project is to demonstrate a new system to support safer and more efficient air travel. The Upnext team says the refitted truck is to be tested live at airports in preparation for testing A350-1000 aircraft in the future. Company officials say if the airport tests are successful, the project could also result in airplane design changes. But getting such systems approved can be a long and difficult process. Gallus said Airbus jets already use some automation technologies to limit pilot error. But those systems are not considered fully autonomous. In other words, they can only predict and behave in certain situations. The testing truck is equipped with light-based LiDAR technology. LiDAR uses a series of sensors and light lasers that can measure distances and produce three-dimensional 3D maps of the surrounding environment. Airbus said the research vehicle is expected to explore 
progressively higher levels of automation as the experiments continue. The company noted it has no immediate plans to introduce autonomous jetliners to the skies. Karim Mokadem is a former automobile executive. He now leads research and technology for Airbus. He told Reuters he thinks LiDAR will be the most effective technology for the testing vehicle. The possible use of LiDAR to improve aircraft safety recently received attention after severe turbulence hit a Singapore Airlines jet. That incident left one passenger dead and several others injured. Researchers have looked at LiDAR technology as a possible way to identify and track possibly dangerous air currents that may not be picked up by radar equipment. Reuters reported that Boeing began testing such a system in 2018. Technology experts are looking to possibly expand LiDAR as a tool to help predict turbulence. I'm Brian Lynn. Brian Lynn joins me now to talk more about his technology report. Hi, Brian. Thanks for joining me. Of course, Ashley. Thank you for having me. This week, you reported on a proposed new system to equip airplanes with self-taxiing technology. We learned that testing of such a system has already started in Europe. But when can we expect to see experiments happening in other parts of the world? So the research team at Airbus is saying these experiments are currently still in the beginning stages in France. Uh, The system did recently receive a lot of attention when the technology was demonstrated at a large technology event in Paris. And at that show, media representatives and members of the public were able to get a close-up look at how the self-taxing tool operates But the researchers say they will have to carry out numerous experiments in airport settings to get the system ready for an eventual final test. And that one is expected to demonstrate a fully automated gate-to-gate trip involving an A350 test aircraft. Some experts noted in the report the new Airbus experiments were announced after several accidents happened at airports that involved taxiing planes. Did Airbus mention anything about those? No, Airbus has not directly linked its new experiments with those incidents, but company officials have said one of the main reasons this technology is being tested now is because of newer advancements with these systems and also the testing methods. And the company has also said one of the main goals of the project is to create a better system to assist pilots on the ground during taxiing operations, which can be quite dangerous. And while these taxi incidents usually do not result in injuries or deaths, they can cost airlines a lot of money and create major passenger delays. Okay. Thanks again for being here, Brian. And thank you for your report. You're welcome. Thank you, Ashley. And I'm Andrew Smith. And my name is Jill Robbins. You're listening to the Lesson of the Day on the Learning English Podcast. Welcome to the part of the show where we help you do more with our series, Let's Learn English. The series shows Ana Mateo in her work and life in Washington, D.C. 
In lesson 38, we meet Anna's best friend from her hometown. Penelope comes to visit Anna in Washington, D.C. Let's listen. Hello. I have great news. My best friend from my hometown is coming here to Washington, D.C. I can't wait to catch up with her. Oh, I gotta go. Her train arrives in 10 minutes. Penelope! Penelope! Anna! I am really happy to see you. Me too. How was your trip? Uh, I was fine. Let me help you with your bags. I'm really excited to be in Washington, D.C. I can't wait to hear about everything. Penelope, I have so much to tell you. Let's go to my apartment. We can talk over a hot cup of tea. Anna says she can't wait to catch up with Penelope. That's a phrasal verb that means to learn what someone has been doing in the recent past. Andrew, when was the last time you met an old friend? And what did you do? Well, by coincidence, just six days ago, this last weekend, I met with an old friend with whom I used to teach. And this friend loves Washington, D.C. and all the museums. So we went to the wonderful East Wing of the National Gallery of Art, and we walked around. And then we had wonderful Mexican food. It was a great day. I went to a high school reunion last year. I met some of my classmates I haven't seen in 50 years. <laughs> I brought my yearbook, and we looked at our old photos and caught up with what we've been doing since graduation. Indeed, it is fun to catch up. Now, let's listen and find out what Anna tells her friend about her new life in Washington, D.C. I love your apartment building, Anna. Is your rent expensive? Well, I have a roommate, so we split the rent. Oh, that's right. Is your roommate nice? Marsha is the nicest person I know in this city. Sometimes she worries too much. And she says I'm the messiest cook she knows. But we are great roommates. So, Anna, is it hard to make friends in D.C.? At first, it was hard. But now, Marsha is a good friend. And there's Pete. Of all the people I know in D.C., Pete is the most serious and also the silliest. He sounds interesting. Mm -hmm. Jonathan and Ashley are two other good friends of mine. In the city, they are the friendliest people I know. They always help me when I need it. Your friends sound great. So, tell me about your job. Anna has made some good friends, hasn't she? We hear some superlatives here. Nicest, friendliest. Messiest and silliest. You are listening to the lesson of the day on the Learning English podcast from Voice of America. We've talked about superlative adjectives in an earlier podcast, but in this lesson, there are some words that change their spelling when we add the suffix est. One is messy which means not neat or tidy. The final letter Y changes to I when we add the EST. Right, and the same thing happens with the words friendly and silly. Let's listen to more of the story. What do you think Anna will tell Penelope about her job? I love my work. I make a children's show called The Time Traveling Treehouse. Anna, that is the best job for you. Do you remember when we were little? We played in that old treehouse behind my family's house for hours. It is really good to talk to you. New friends are good, but old friends are the best. Ah, now we know where that idea came from. Anna's childhood games. Jill, do you remember that old expression? 
Make new friends, but keep the old? Yes, I do. I think it's a song. One is silver and the other gold. That means friends are valuable, whether they're new friends or old friends. You know, at the end of this lesson, we get a hint of what may be coming in the next Let's Learn English series. Anna invites Penelope to come and live in Washington, D.C. I know. Our hometown isn't the same now. You are not there. No crying. No crying. Penelope, why don't you move here and live with me and Marcia? Anna, I can't leave our hometown. You forget. I love my job, too. I didn't forget. You are the most famous turkey farmer I know. Thanks, Anna. Come on, let's go eat dinner at one of DC's most famous restaurants. Awesome! I have a great apartment, I love my work, and I have awesome friends. I am the luckiest woman in Washington, DC! Until next time, I noticed another kind of superlative there. But in this kind, we do not add the suffix est. Instead, we use the most, as in... You are the most famous turkey farmer I know. Wow, you know, my nephew and his wife are turkey farmers. Since this podcast is coming out around the holiday of Thanksgiving, when we eat a lot of turkey... Let's give a shout-out to turkey farmers and the hard work they do. <laughs> okay, we'll do that. And a shout-out means we'll just call attention to them. Uh, Jill, I was trying to explain why some adjectives don't add EST for the superlative. Oh, sorry. Just make that little rewind sound, Andrew, and we can replay what I said in Podcast 27. Yep. When the adjective is longer, usually two or more syllables, we just put the two words the most or the least before it. Thanks, Jill. One exception to the rule, sorry listeners, you should know by now that English grammar rules have a lot of exceptions. One exception is the word friendly. It is two syllables but it can still add the EST to make the superlative friendliest. Some other superlative adjectives that take the most are dangerous and difficult. For example, raising turkeys is the most difficult job my niece does. I think that's enough about turkeys, Dr. Jill. Let's get our listeners involved here. When was the last time you caught up with an old friend? What did you do together? How long had it been since you last saw each other? Please write to us at learningenglish at voanews.com or in the comments on our YouTube video. Remember, you can find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, or our website, learningenglish.voanews.com. We hope you have enjoyed the lesson of the day on the Learning English Podcast. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. I'm Dr. Jill, and I'm going to make some pies now for our Thanksgiving dinner tonight. Mm, that turkey's going to be so yummy. Well, save some for me, Jill. I'm Andrew Smith. That's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. Thank you.